So this is the study guide video for paper two. Uh, just a quick reminder, paper two is composed of two hours. And for that, you have to write two essays. And you have to choose one prompt from two separate option areas. And they're worth 22 points each, is what, if you wanted to know. In this video specifically, we will be concentrating on abnormal psychology, or the area of abnormal psychology. And there's three uh, specific sections that abnormal, uh, abnormal psychology splits into. It is either anxiety, uh, affective disorders, or eating disorders. And then the specific uh, disorder itself within those is either specific phobia, major depressive disorder, and anorexia. And this video will mainly focus on the first two, the effect, I mean, and the last two, affective disorder and eating disorder. And we know that affective disorders affect our mood, which is why major depressive disorder is there. And then eating is anorexia nervosa. So we're gonna concentrate on that. And in our next video, we're gonna concentrate on human relationships. And so I'm gonna give to a, take a quick pause. So since this are study guides for IBHL, the, in case you don't know what the book is, I, Psychology, IB Diploma, uh, the chapter of abnormal psychology runs from page 144 all the way to page 182. And what we're gonna concentrate here is, well, we're gonna start off with uh, affective disorders. And so the possibilities are of the questions, there's a total of 12 questions that you could possibly get. Six of the questions, well, two of the questions you can find on page 144, and then the next set of questions you can find on page 156. But if you look at all the questions on page 156, you can see that they're basically asking you the same thing. They're either asking you to compare just yes, one of the disorders or to compare two sections of two separate disorders. And so when it says compare two, such as, Describe symptoms of one of the disorders from two of the following groups. So you would either pick anxiety and eating, anxiety effective, and, and so on. And so for me personally, I would pick affective disorder and eating disorder. And then I would do major depressive disorder. And I would do anxiety, ner uh, not anxiety, anorexia nervosa. And I would specifically concentrate on the symptoms and prevalence. And so for what I would recommend is concentrating on two specific disorders. And so the first disorder that we're going to focus on is major depressive disorder. And major depressive disorder is basically what you could start off by saying, so regardless of which disorder you pick, you're going to have to do an introduction paragraph. And so that introduction paragraph can either focus on abnormal psychology overall. Abnormal psychology is the branch of psychology that tends to include studying, explaining, and treating abnormal behavior. You could go even further to explain what abnormal behavior is. The word behavior itself can sometimes prove to be controversial as abnormal behavior could be identified in many cases. And then you go on, you can even go on to describe how these this, uh, disorders are diagnosed. And something that I like to remember, as you could say, is Dahlia smell mangoes. And well, you might wonder, well, what does that have to do with abnormal psychology? Well, Dahlia Smell Mangos DSM, that is the diagnostic criteria book that we're gonna be using. The DSM is the book, and unless your question specifies how do different cultures identify abnormal behaviors, then that's where you have to pick, uh, write about the other books, which we can explore on later on. And so, after your introduction paragraph, you're gonna eventually have, depending on which part, which question you get on the test, you're either gonna concentrate on the diagnostic criteria, on the etiologies, on the prevalence rates, on the treatment. But what I'm gonna do in this video is just gonna go a run over of what abnormal psychology is. And I'm gonna concentrate on just a paper, that way you don't have to be looking at the screen, and you can be listening to this while you're doing whatever you wanna do. <laughs> And so diagnostic criteria, the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder is set, as I told you before, the DSM, uh, IBTR, you can uh, opt that out if you want, but the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder is A to E. A has nine subsections. And so an easy way to remember that is, I would say, <laughs> Well, we start off with affective disorder, so it's obviously an affective disorder. It starts off at A, but then it goes all the way to E, and so you, depressive disorder has a lot of E's. 
So because of the many E's that you can find in depressive, we know that we're going to go all the way to the letter E in our diagnostic criteria. So the first set of diagnostic criteria, letter A, states that five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period. They represent a change in previous functioning, and at least one of the symptoms is either depressed mood or loss of interest. And what I'm basically saying by that is that one of the symptoms you have to have is either depressed mood or loss of interest. And then you have to have at least five or more of the nine symptoms that the book itself gives you, which is depressed mood most of the day. So like you walk in and you walk in the morning and you're like, I don't want to be here. Depressed mood. And no interest or pleasure in mostly every day seen by self, others, or other views. If you get told by many people, oh, you don't have interest, or I don't have interest in doing this, I don't get pleasure from doing this, then that's the second system. Weight loss, gain, and change in appetite. You know, when you're going to eat, we eat mostly three meals a day, so when you don't feel hungry. Insomnia or hypersomnia, nearly every day, something that high schoolers have. Uh, retardation or slowness. I would sometimes be careful using the word retardation because it's uh, like a stone you don't want to go into with the IB graders. But then you go on to fatigue or loss of energy. And then you feeling of worthlessness or excessive inappropriate guilt, difficulty concentrating or indecisiveness, or constant thoughts about death or suicide ones. And something that I like to remember is a typical high school day. So you walk in, you don't want to be there in the first period because at 7.30, no one wants to be studying Chinese. And so I'm already depressed. And then the second thing is that I hate Chinese. I don't even know why I've taken four years of it, so I find no interest in it. And then I realize that I didn't eat breakfast that morning, so I'm losing weight, and my change in appetite is changing. And then I remember that the night before that, I couldn't sleep because I had insomnia or hyperinsomnia. And then my slowness, well, I can't really learn what she's saying after she repeated it three times. And then I yawn 55 times in my first class, and so I know I'm tired. And then my teacher comes over to me and she tells me, you're worthless. So I start feeling worth it, and then I can't concentrate, and then I start thinking about death and suicide. Your typical first period every day in high school can be some love to show the nine symptoms one must feel and that's the first diagnostic criteria. We then go on to uh, do not meet criteria for a mixed episode or mania. This is letter B. And then letter C of the diagnostic criteria is that symptoms cause great amount of stress. And what we like to put in the, our writing is clinically significant. So it's just not stress like normal stress. It's something that can be clinically tested, not tested, but like observed. And then symptoms are not to direct psychological effects of substance such as abuse or medication, some sense of use. So obviously we don't want to diagnose someone with depressive disorder because they're feeling this way because they're overdosing on cocaine, LSPD, uh, LSD. LSD, my apologies. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, some of us don't know drugs. Uh, or Santax, Ranitidine, there we go. The prescribed medications also work. Uh, the symptoms are not, uh, are not labels as ones for a last one, last longer than two months, and are much or more complexity. So obviously we don't want to label someone with depressive disorder because they lost the last one, because that's common to feel all these symptoms. But if they go on more than two months, then that's when we start diagnosing them. And then I want to go on to the prevalence rates. Uh, that's a, something else you would have, have to study. So then the MED is the leading cause, so major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. between the ages 15 and 44, and a lifetime prevalence of 16.6. .6. So it has almost three sixes, and you know, you tend to remember that three sixes is a bad number, and we know the major depressive disorder is a bad number, so we tend to remember 666. Yet the real number is 16.6. .6. So you just, for, you just put a number in the front, and that's usually around a study done by Kessler Americans, 2004. Polish men had a prevalence rate of 20.4%, and both Polish and Russian women were at a high of 32.9 and 33.7. And you can use those numbers to compare all over the world. The cultural impact it sometimes says is that sometimes going to the doctor to treat mood, mood problems is not an expected path of action. And that itself tends to what increase these numbers of prevalence rates or decrease the prevalence rates. And that for it right now concludes this video. This video is going to be split into three sub, um, sub videos. 
This first video was about the introduction of abnormal psychology with the diagnostic criteria. The next video for this is etiologies, the biological, cognitive, and social. And then we will conclude with the third video of this section, which is treatment, which includes biomed, individual group. And of course, always remember to subscribe, comment, like. Thank you.